We have all now resigned from the Labour Party. Leaving the party to join the new independent group. The new independent group of MPs boosted its membership to 11. This needs to be something that involves all those people who feel disenfranchised and that there's not a proper choice. Lots of people might agree with their strapline that politics is broken. And many people say that they feel unrepresented by the current party system. But does that necessarily mean that this new party will do well in elections? And I'm very sad at people who've left our party. I really am. Absolutely good riddance. They're nothing more than neoliberal careerist ladder climbers. Commentators say the financial crisis and its aftermath sounded the death knell for centrist parties. Is the centre ground of British politics really dead, or could it make a comeback? And what does the centre even mean these days? If Labour are hard left because of their policies, then so are most of the British public. This question of so many Labour politicians, I get very different answers. You've talked about Corbyn being an embarrassment to you. Is he a Marxist, in your view? I think so, yes. Thank you. That's it. (laughs) Welcome back to Polarised, the podcast from the RSA that's all about the big divides in our politics and our culture. And, of course, how we should fix them. It's presented by Ian Leslie and by me, Matthew Taylor. This week, we're asking, what does the future hold for the politics of the centre? Coming up, we're going to be speaking to our uh, go-to expert when it, when it comes to understanding public opinion, uh, Paula Surridge, the political sociologist. We've had her on before uh, uh, and no doubt we'll have her on again. She's an incredibly shrewd analysis of, of the electorate. But before that, we like to make sure that you know what our assumptions are and where we're coming from and, and whatever else before we dive into each episode's topic. We call this the full disclosure segment. And actually this week, it really is a a, a full disclosure, at least for me, because I should say, before we get into a discussion of uh, TIG, that one of its members is a cousin of mine, uh, Chris Leslie. I hope I can still be an independent analyst of of TIG. Matthew, you will will, um, chip in if you think I'm being too partisan. But it's been a really kind of fascinating couple of weeks and would like to kind of think about where it goes next. So our previous episode was all about divides within political parties. And it was released the same week as those 11 MPs split away from their parties. But in the interests of full disclosure, we, we actually recorded it three days before that happened. So we haven't had a chance to, to talk about it yet. Matthew, what do you make of the independent group? Uh, I think that in a, in a sense... <laughs> When we ask, well, what do they stand for? It's a bit like saying to somebody who's been in a room where someone set off a stink bomb and run out of the room and to say to them, well, why are you standing in the garden? Well, overwhelmingly, the reason they're in the garden is because of the stink bomb in the the house rather than the nature of the garden. But they will have to define that garden. They're going to have to design uh, their garden. On the other hand, they're also going to have to decide what exists uh, in the centre. So... Uh, here, just so that I can be proven wrong, uh, here's a set of predictions for the next uh, few months um, of politics. And anyone who does a football accumulator, let me explain the concept to you, which is I'm going to describe a set of things that I think individually are more likely than not. But of course, if you multiply lots of those things, you end up with something that's unlikely. So ultimately, what I'm describing is unlikely, although individual bits, I think, are likely. So number one, Theresa May will get a deal through. Number two, pretty soon after that, she'll be told to, to leave. Uh, Number three, we'll then have a a fight in the Conservative Party, primarily between a kind of ERG Canada-type candidate and a more establishment Norway-type candidate. Uh, I suspect Michael Gove, who I think has played a very canny political hand, uh, might come through the middle. Interestingly, he's been kind of sanitised, because although people associate him with Brexit, because he's not ERG, he now seems quite reasonable by comparison. And also, he's got that kind of Cameronian capacity to say, well, I'll appeal to different people. I'll appeal to young people, appeal to the the groups the Conservatives aren't touching at all at the moment. He's, he's, he's slightly saddled by the fact that he's Michael Gove. Well, that's true. But I think he's, he, I think he's done well, quite well to kind of get rid of the goveness of, of, of his, of his Govesy. Uh, Vince Cable will stand down, uh, will be replaced probably by Joe Swinson, young, female. At that point, Joe Swinson might, in her declaration or during her campaign, so, say, look, I really want an arrangement with these TIG people. Let's have some kind of electoral pact. At that point, they could attract a lot more MPs. And at that point, we end up with three parties, a socialist Labour Party, a progressive centre party, 
and a Conservative Party in British politics by the autumn of this year is fundamentally realigned. Do I think that's likely? No. But each individual step, I think, is quite likely. <laughs> There's a lot to get into there, so we don't need to get into all of it. But So, so let's, let's just kind of um, keep the focus on, on TIG and Labour at the moment. Because I think your overall analysis, whether or not it actually happens, what you're saying is things are fragmenting and, and, and rearranging. Actually, even with, within Labour, right? So, so we might talk about the fact that later on that arguably there's another kind of faction that's about to split semi-formally or, or otherwise the kind of Tom Watson faction. You know, we want to stay in the party, but we, we're going to kind of act as a block within the, the PLP. So I just want to talk about TIG and Labour and and. Uh, what, what, why has so, so TIG seems to be doing, I think, unexpectedly well uh, in the polls, right? So this might be short lived, it might be illusory. And certainly, if you're thinking about in terms of long term political success, which involves getting elected and, and so on, uh, it's very unlikely that TIG will succeed, right? In, in inverted commas, it all depends on how you define success, because one of their goals might just be to change the Labour Party by leaving it, right? I don't know. But that's kind of one of the ways in which you might kind of frame the, the goals of, of TIG. But it's kind of interesting to me that it has made such an impact, at least if you look at the polls. It's been unusually uh, or, or kind of surprisingly well noticed. It's it's getting kind of regularly substantial scores in the polls for, for a, an entity which has said very little about itself. And, you know, bearing in mind that most people don't watch, don't think about politics most of the time. And that should be really worrying to the main political parties, but particularly to Labour. Right, so why is Labour's support, which is already kind of not as high as it should be, given the state of the government, why is it, is it so vulnerable? And the more that the Labour leadership supporters go on about how these terrible bunch of complete nobody losers with no policies are a complete waste of time, the more, the more worried they should be. Because you know, if a bunch of losers with no policies could do this to you, you know, with one press conference, then, uh, you know, what, what happens if, if, you know, it just shows how kind of soft their supporters and how uh, dissatisfied people are with with Corbyn, Corbyn's leadership. I mean, he's the most unpopular opposition leader for, for over 30 years now. So I think what this boils down to, for me, uh, if, you're, if you're talking about, uh, about the Labour Party, is... The, the the question does does Jeremy Corbyn and the people around Jeremy Corbyn his entourage do they really want to run the country or do they in the end just want to make sure that the Labour Party becomes a socialist party which they maintain control of and I think in the end I still think it's the second is them uh, you know the the, the 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 first would be a bonus but in a sense it's not within their control. The second is the thing they want to make absolutely certain happens, that there's no possibility the Labour Party ever goes back to being a more centrist party. And I think that the reality is that if Jeremy Corbyn were to end up after the next election with, you know, 150 Labour MPs, but a true socialist party, command of the trade unions, uh, as far as he and the hard left were concerned, this would be a massive victory. This would be the strongest hard left to be in this country, you know, for a century. So uh, I think that, that, you know, that's the dynamic here. And where, and I want to talk about Tom Watson a bit later, if we've got time, you know, where Tom is, is Tom is, is saying that we still, we want to be a party of government. And if we're going to be a party of government, we've got to have the capacity to deal with attacks on us. We've got to have a way of uh, an emotionally intelligent, inclusive way of responding to TIG, of dealing with anti-Semitism or, or, or whatever. But but I'm afraid, it, in a way, it misses the point. Because the point here is not what do we have to do to win power. The point is, uh, how do we make sure that the Labour Party is a socialist party? The reaction to TIG was, was so, uh, from the Labour leadership and its supporters were so uh, self-destructive. It's funny enough, when you look at the, the statements that made by um, the, the Tories after Heidi Allen and, 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 and the others defected, they were very much along the lines of, oh, well, you know, we're very sad. Um, we, we wish them well. We, we, you know, we think the Tories are moving in the right direction. But it was calm um, and, and, and slightly regretful. And the reaction of the Labour uh, uh, leaders was, was kind of vituperative, angry yeah. um and and at the same time as dismissing them as completely unimportant totally obsessed you know they're sort of tweeting about it every five minutes and saying this thing is not important over and over and over again this thing is going to fail over and over and over again look if it's not important it's going to fail fine you might well be right in which case you, you don't need to worry about it um they just make themselves look so sort of insecure and needy and my theory about them is that they never really recovered from the shock of doing unexpectedly well in 2017. 
uh, up until then, they had developed, you know, they were thriving on this bunker mentality, which is us against the world. And everyone thinks we're going to lose and we're, we're, we're going to do better than everyone thinks. Then they do do better than everyone thinks. But they don't then make the mental adjustment they need to make, which is, OK, well, we're, we're in charge now. Our control of the party is pretty much unchallenged. That means we can afford to be more magnanimous, more, more generous. We can, we can reach out. We can just calm down a bit. They never got to that stage. But that's why there and we can agree to disagree because I don't think... You, what you're, you're assuming that after the election, they think, OK, we're on the verge of power, so let's start doing some of the things that you would do if you wanted to be in power, which is, for example, really fundamentally addressing some of the perceptions the public might have about us that are negative. But m- my view is that is a secondary consideration, and the primary consideration is the Labour Party being a true socialist party. And if that's your analysis, then you will not do things which detract from your true socialism for the sake of um, becoming more popular with the public. That is that is the heart of it. So in terms of what I would do if I was as TIG, I mean, they've, they've, they've chosen Chukka as their spokesperson. I think you need a spokesperson, otherwise it's the, the, the media just get irritated because they don't know who to go to. But, but well, I think... What's the ideological... Or what's the kind of political space uh, for them? They, they can't just be, you know, reheated Blairism. They, they, they can't be... You know, that's, that's... So I think you can identify issues where you would say that they are clearly different from the Labour Party and on the other hand also for the for the three Conservative women they're different from the Conservative Party so the TIG group would not be anti-American viscerally anti-American in a way that the Labour leadership is they would not be viscerally anti-capitalism or anti-big business in the way that a lot on the left tend to be so I you know I think you can start to identify issue by issue when it comes to public service reform, they would probably have a view which was, you know, public service reform can't, you can't simply get public services by them simply being in the public sector. You have to think a little bit about how they work and their incentives and, and stuff like that. The fact that someone's a public servant doesn't necessarily mean you get their virtuous and you get Rauk. So you can identify a, a set of, you can identify, yeah, it, well, it is Blairite. Of course, it's, <laughs> of course it's Blairite. I mean, you know, surprise, surprise. You know, it is that it, it is that broad positioning. They will need to develop an agenda. I think the kind of things they should be talking about are the environment, because I don't think that the Labour Party talks much about the environment. And secondly, technology. You know, I think there's a massive space, space in British politics for a party to come along and say, on the one hand, technology could be amazing. We could, you know, it could transform our lives and our society. On the other hand, at the moment, it's in the wrong hands. It's dangerous. We need government to protect us. So environment and technology and a kind of new story about social inclusion. But I think they're right probably not to overdefine themselves at the moment. Wait till Brexit's out of the way because there's no point trying to do anything until we know where we are in relation to Brexit or on, say, at least this stage of Brexit. I'd wait to get past the local elections because they shouldn't stand candidates in the local elections because that will absolutely burn their bridges in terms of going back to their host parties if those parties change. I think the, I think the leadership of Liberal Democrats are really, is really important here. I think if the Liberal Democrats get new, more dynamic leadership then the question is completely obvious. Why would you have Liberal Democrats standing against Tiggers and Tiggers standing against Liberal Democrats? Of course, when Tig people stand in elections and make speeches, presumably that's Tig of the stump. (laughs) And on that bombshell. (laughs) On the line, we've got Paula Surridge. Thank you so much for joining us, Paula. No problem. Paula, you're joining us because we hope that you'll help us get a handle on how the independent group uh, is doing in the polls and more generally uh, what the public thinks about the centre ground um, of politics. Uh, Just so our listeners know, you're a political sociologist, senior lecturer at the University of Bristol. We've had you on before. We're delighted to have you uh, back. And we couldn't think of anyone better to help us understand this kind of question of (laughs) what's going on in the centre ground of British politics. Who did the TIGs appeal to? Who could the TIGs uh, appeal to? So let's start. But the question I think we asked you when, when we had you on right at the beginning of the of the run of Polarised, which is, who are the people in British society who could legitimately claim at the moment to be badly underrepresented by our major parties? OK, so I think I prefer to answer that question by who feels underrepresented rather than thinking about it in terms of party manifestos. And in that sense, what we see is that those on the left feel less represented than those on the right. That's 
pretty standard when you've got a Conservative government, Labour Party voters feel unrepresented and vice versa. But more importantly than that, um, what you find is that those that are further away from the liberal end of a sort of social liberal, social conservatism scale, the closer they are to social conservatism, the less represented they feel currently, um, regardless of what their position is on in terms of kind of economics. So that I, that's exactly your... Uh, you have the wonderful consistency of an academic. It's exactly what you said last time. So the economically liberal but socially conservative are the underrepresented groups. So, so socially conservative. So what kinds of issues do we? So socially conservative. Um, I'm thinking there of issues like crime and punishment. They tend to prefer stronger stances on sentencing. Iconically, the, the death penalty, but it doesn't have to be about the death penalty. Um, they tend to like. Um, stronger leadership. They tend to be in favour of schools teaching children to obey authority rather than to be um, expressive individuals. Those those kinds of big value issues, if you like. So the independent group has, has defined itself in terms of values so far, you know, rather than announcing specific policies, uh, you know, in large part because they, they've only just set up. Is that a, a good strategy? How long should they kind of hold on to that idea that we're just about values? Should they kind of hold off from introducing too, too many policies? And, and, and what do we know about what the public support for those values are? So I think that the, um, the independent group should avoid putting too much down in terms of policy for as long as they possibly can and keep applying things in terms of values. I think their framing of broken politics is quite smart in that respect because people can project into it what they think it means. So it allows voters to get on board with the um, group, they're not quite a party yet, by thinking that they're like them, thinking that they share their values, and then they'll be more receptive to the policies when they come. Um, so if I were advising them, I would say, keep, keep it general, keep it about values, and don't worry about policy, really, until we get into an election campaign, because actually lots of voters aren't really paying that much attention to the detail till then anyway. So, so just th- thinking about the the political impact of tick for a second, and then we'll kind of go on to the broader issues of of what and whether there there is a, a big space for for any kind of new new party. Um, it, has it done better than you might have expected in in terms of the polls, or or about the same or worse? If if it has done better, uh, uh, why do you think that is? So I think we have to be very, very cautious with the polling around this at the moment. The main thing it's p- picking up, I suspect, is just whether or not people have heard of the party or the group it would be more accurate, I suppose, rather than real intention to vote for it. But the really interesting yeah. thing that it's done to the polling is that it's made it much more uncertain than it was before. So I have a, I have a minor obsession with keeping an eye on what the don't knows are doing in polling. The, the poll, polling companies don't tend to report them as part of their um, newspaper stories, but they can tell us some really interesting things. And since, since uh, the independent group story broke and, they, and, and have been included in polling, we've seen the proportion of people saying that they don't know how they will vote really leap up. Mm. And prior to this, what we'd seen actually, it was pretty flat according to previous party voted for. If anything, there was a small tendency for leave voters to be the most undecided. But since this happened, it shot up and it shot up most amongst 2017 Labour voters and Remain voters. So there's now anything, depending on which polls you look at, anything from a quarter to a third of people saying that they don't know which party they'll vote for. Um, and this was a pattern that we saw prior to the 2017 election and accounts for a lot of the, the volatility that we saw in 2017 was those don't know voters who in 2017 kind of returned home to Labour. At the moment, it's unclear whether they will do that again or whether this is a longer term movement into don't know and then on to something else. So, well, I mean, one idea there is that when they're thinking about a name for their party, possibly the Don't Know Party uh, it would be the most popular label they, they, they could have. It used to be said, Paul, and tell me if this is still true, that there were no such thing really as a Liberal Democrat voters. What there was was a conserv- were, the, were disillusioned Conservative voters who voted Liberal Democrat to stop Labour, and or disillusioned Labour voters who voted Liberal Democrat to stop the Conservatives, that, that there were 
kind of lifelong cut me through the middle conservatives and labor but there wasn't there wasn't such a thing apart from a tiny group of activists is that generally speaking true of people in the center ground that they don't really identify as being centrists they identify it be as being more centrist than the thing they want once were or more centrist than the party that might otherwise win well i think that we have to be very careful talking about centrist in that language to begin with because the thing about this group is that they're setting themselves up as centrist in terms of economics but they're not particularly centrist in terms of that socially liberal, social conservative scale. And the public don't think on a single dimension anymore. People hold values on multiple dimensions. Now, the Liberal Democrats, yes, I think that's, that's definitely the case, that they attracted a lot of voters who didn't necessarily think of themselves as Liberal Democrats. But what we've seen over time is that increasingly people don't see themselves as a party person in the same way. The levels of identification, very strong identification with political parties has been declining dramatically. So I think what that does is it opens up a space for parties to appeal on the basis of values because actually people are not kind of free-floating rational consumers, but they're looking for other cues to link them to parties rather than their, their party identity that they would have had maybe 30, 35 years ago. Are you saying that the, the independent group are See, well, they would be seen as socially liberal on on your scale, uh, or, or is it or is it a little bit more ambiguous than that? Well, I don't, I don't think they have been as explicit as that yet. But when you look at particularly their um, very pro Remain stance, it tends to go along with that set of values. Yeah. Um, so I think as they are pushed more and more, not not so much on policy, but just to say what they think about the world, that liberal stance will become more apparent. Um, and that's where the I think the danger is is for them is that actually there's not as many voters in that bit of space. Although although they could uh well compensate uh for for I mean don't compensate is the wrong word because I think there's for, for at least some of them it's probably where their instincts are on things like foreign policy, there could be more uh, robust yes. or on crime and so on. So there are spaces where they can balance. Absolutely. Um, and I think the, the one of the groups that we saw really switch between um, Conservative and Labour in 2017 were a group that were broadly speaking centrist on the economy, maybe slightly to the left of centre, but, but much more closer to the centre than Labour were at the time, who were actually quite comfortable with liberal positions on things like sexuality, gender identity, those kinds of issues, but actually weren't particularly liberal on issues around crime and foreign policy. And that group of voters who did swing from Conservative to Labour between 2015 and 2017, I suspect some volatility is still there and they may well be a good a, a good group for this, this new grouping to appeal to. It's likely, Paula, that in the next 12 months we'll have a Conservative leadership uh, election. It sounds to me from what you're saying that, that in some ways this divide is even more stark on the right in the sense that that leadership, I mean, one assumes that that leadership campaign is going to be dominated by the implementation of Brexit, assuming Theresa May gets her deal through and there'll be a kind of Canada candidate and a Norway candidate. But actually, from what I'm hearing from you is that the real ideological cleavage on the right is between socially conservative voters who who traditionally have been represented on the right, the, the clues in the name, and the kind of Cameronian, economic liberal, socially liberal uh, side. Yes, definitely. I think I think there is a divide there. I mean, there's a similar divide on the left as well, but it, but the divide is there on the right, and you can see how a group of voters who who voted for Cameron because they were socially liberal but but broadly broadly on board with economic policy could then have been completely turned off um, by the Conservatives in 2017 and then switch over to Corbyn's Labour. It seems like a big jump, but when you actually look at their values and, and, the, and the positions they take, it is in, entirely understandable. Because for the TIG to become socially conservative, that's quite a leap because there isn't really a tradition... <laughs> in recent times of social conservatism on the left. But that is a natural position for the for the Tories. And of course, Margaret, you know, one of Margaret Thatcher's, you know, a, a bit of uh, what, her genius really was to be able to combine, not necessarily intellectually coherently, but certainly in the level of narrative, social conservatism and economic liberalism. Yes, and, and I think the, the early speeches we heard from Theresa May did that as well. You know, the, the, the first speech um, as leader, where she talked about the just about managing groups and so on, it sounded as though that was where her um, narrative was going to be. 
Um, but then, obviously, Brexit takes over, the election campaign took over, and it didn't end up being in quite that position after all. Can I just ask, uh, Paula, about environmentalism? Because in America, environmentalism is absolutely an issue that goes with the kind of Democrat-Republican divide. In Germany, things have become much more interesting because there is a large, significant group, of, there's a significant group of German, people in Germany who are conservative in many ways, but strong environmentalists. I'm interested in Britain, the polling you do in Britain, attitudes in Britain, how does environmentalism play out across our political spectrum? So it, I would say at the moment we're closer to the American position than right. the German position in that most of those who are most um, concerned about the environment, who express that as one of their most important issues, do tend to be on that very liberal end. Um, and also they also tend to be quite left-wing economically as well. Now, some of that may actually be driven by our party system and indeed the American party system in that some of it is party cues. So sets of values that are not just coming from the electorate, they're also put together as packages by parties. And so because we have quite a, a rigid party structure, there hasn't been a party representing that set of values, so people are perhaps less likely to, to articulate it. Paula Sarage, thank you very much for coming back on to Polarised. If people want to read more of your work, where can they go? So um, I have my own series of blogs on Medium, so you can, you can find me there. But there's also on the value stuff more generally a series of blogs with the LSE blog that have looked at some of these um, value issues in a bit more detail as well. And I think there's a place where you can fill in a question and find out what you're, who you are. That's right. Yes. So the work I've been doing um, with BMG, who are a polling organisation based up in Birmingham, um, there's a little tool that you can go through, fill out some answers to values questions and find out which of the values clans uh, you belong to. Thanks, Paula. By the way, I've done your values clan test. Can you tell me what colour you think I am? What colour do I think you are? Or oh, what, gosh. what tribe? Go on, have a guess. Um, I am going to guess... Global Green Community. Well done. Thank you, Paula. Wow, she's good. <laughs> she's good. <laughs> Thanks, Paula. Gosh, put me on the spot a bit, that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, what did you, you're a great fan of Paula's, I know, Ian. What did mm. you think of that? Um, well, I, I, it's just really interesting to hear her kind of talk about TIG through, through the lens of her uh, kind of framework for understanding the electorate. So, you know, she said last time we, we talked to her that, that, that the real kind of um, space here was, was left authoritarianism. <laughs> you know, kind of people who are uh, economically on the left, strong supporters of the NHS, nationalisation, public spending, but also are probably pretty uh, relatively down on, on immigration and want to see stronger kind of uh, punishment for, for crime, want a robust foreign, foreign policy. Now, on some of these things, the, the TIG is never going to appeal to people who are obviously pro, pro-Brexit, which is kind of where these guys, mm. these guys are, uh, although that depends on how salient the Brexit issue is. It may not be as salient in a couple of years' time as it is now. And, and, you know, it can't be a kind of anti-immigration price, just not where, where, where they are. But it can do some of those, it can send some of those socially conservative signals. And we're really kind of stretching the term socially conservative now, just to talk about things like, you know, being strong uh, at, on, on defence, being strong on, on crime, which are actually, you know, not particularly left-right issues either. Uh, you can make a you know, very powerful left-wing case for both those things. So I think there is a a, a chance for them to occupy that a similar um, space there and, and really make headway. And actually, they can they can outflank Corbyn's Labour on the left on and economically in in some ways. The Labour Manifesto 2017 has this big kind of giveaway to you know on tuition fees, which, which is arguably a big middle class. Subsidy, mm. right? Arguably, I'm, everybody don't don't <laughs> write in. I'm not making the case. I say there are ways in which you could say uh, we, we, there's actually a more radical kind of alternative to what you're proposing. So I think it's, I thought it was very interesting as well, Ian, and I think that the, the social conservative thing is important because the problem, in a way, I'm not socially conservative, but I think it's important that somebody holds that ground because if it's not held, the only place it's going to be held is on the hard right of you know, on the extreme right of politics, actually. Yeah. And I think there is a, a group of people who could be mobilised by that message. In fact, we're reading about 
this just in the last couple of days that there's quite a lot of it looks like if UKIP was to be a, a force again it would it would garner quite a lot of support the problem is you've almost said in is, is what you have said is is that what is the policy here because actually is it really capital pun- no it's not going to I mean no no one it's hard to see a mainstream party advocating no, capital, punishment. capital punishment. You know, we bang up too many prisoners already. Our welfare system has been incredibly punitive. And in fact, I think people recognise now that oh, that whole conditionality regime didn't really work as well as being very kind of cruel. Um, so, you know, yes, more police on the beat, I guess. There's that kind of stuff. I think the only, the, the one possibility here, and maybe we can talk about this in a future programme, is to redefine nationalism. So can you, and this is where I think the German Greens have been so clever, because the German Greens have said, look, being green is part of being German. It's not our contribution, it's not our altruistic contribution to solving a global problem. It's our German identity to be green. So I think the way to deal with this is to say social authoritarians believe in nation above everything else. And they believe that we, that people have a duty to nation. So you need to articulate a vision for the nation. Well, they, they believe in Britain. I mean, patriotism, right? Isn't patriotism. that the word? Yeah. yeah. Um, and we, I've said it before. We've discussed this before. It's one of the great kind of strategic errors of, of the left to kind of give up the patriotic ground to the right. Uh, yeah, so I think, I think that's right. I think that is a powerful space for them to play in. Before we go, we like to end each episode with a provocation, something that's shifted the way we look at the world just a little bit. Matthew, what has provoked you this week? I've become a bit obsessed by Tom Watson, Ian. (laughs) That's an unhealthy obsession. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Let me explain. So I've known Tom for a very long time. You know, he's he's a brilliant kind of machine politician. And one of the things he used to do, I'm told, uh, is that uh, when I was running IPPR, the think tank, uh, that whenever there was a by-election, he wanted to get a trade union candidate selected. He would brief the Guardian, who in the Guardian would then reprint this, that I was I Matthew Taylor was going to be imposed as the Blairite candidate on the basis, presumably, that the thought of me was so frightening that people would rush into the arms of the GMB candidate. So I've got some kind of history with Tom, but <laughs> what really interests me about and we we also support the same football team, and I like him. You know, I personally like him, but. What interests me about Tom is this. On the one hand, he is this kind of machine politician. Nobody knows the system better than he does. He's got brilliant networks. He knows the, you know, all that stuff. He knows how to make the machine work. On the other hand, he's clearly a very kind of passionate man. You know, so you know, he, he, he got it right about phone hacking and Murdoch, and he really led on that, and he was very passionate on that. Brilliant. He got it completely wrong, of course, about paedophile conspiracies, which he was similarly passionate about. And now... He's kind of having this fight. Now, I think most people look at Tom and the row he's having with the Jenny Formby the, about anti-Semitism and what he's doing in the Labour Party, and they think there must be a, a something behind this. There must be a plan. You know, he must have things lined up, ready to do something. But I think, well, maybe not, because I think maybe he's just got to the stage where he can't bear it anymore, and he just is emoting. So I think what interests me about Tom, in a sense, is the impossibility, and maybe I'm wrong about this, of combining these two things. It's as if he's two people. It's as if he's the technocratic machine politician and he's the kind of passionate values person, but he can't turn them into... He can't, they can't be melded. That is fascinating. And, and it really does help explain a question that's been on my mind, which is, yeah, what's his game here? Like, what's, what's his end game? Where, where's it leading to? Or, or, or does he think at some point we'll have to kind of split away somehow? And actually, I think you've answered it, which is he doesn't, necess- he doesn't necessarily think that sort of strategically about it. He's really kind of acting on, on gut instinct as much as he is uh, uh, strategically. Yeah, I think and he, he happens to be a brilliant tactician as well. So, Yeah, exactly. I think it's just how he responded to Murdoch and, and what he thought was happening with paedophiles it's something must be done and i must do it and i admire him for that but do i think he's got the machine behind him i suspect he hasn't and this comes back to what we talked about right at the beginning which is that in the end it's hard to change the labor party Uh, but time will tell maybe there is a plan that maybe tom does have a plan but uh, i wouldn't make i wouldn't take it for granted is what i'd say that's it for this episode of Polarised. We'll be back again in a couple of weeks time if you've enjoyed this episode of course in a couple of weeks time we'll know whether or not we're staying in the European Union or not? I'm no. obviously we're probably not, but two weeks' time, it feels like such a long time. Anyway, carry on. Um, so if you've enjoyed this episode, please tell somebody about it. If you haven't enjoyed it, just, just keep quiet about it. We'd really appreciate it if you took just a couple of minutes to leave us uh, a positive rating or review in your podcast app. 
Polarised was presented by Matthew Taylor and Ian Leslie. The producer was James Shield with help from Gareth Evans in Bristol. And we were brought to you by the RSA.